Yeah, okay, I suppose we can jump right in here. Uh, good day. I am over at the uh, Towel, Towley, however you like to say it. I just think of Towley from, uh, from South Park. Anyway, we're over at uh, some nice conservation lands out in uh, Carlisle, Massachusetts. We've been here before, uh, maybe a month or two ago, probably about a month and a half ago. Looking for some, uh, looking for some interesting stuff, but, uh, if I remember correctly, I mean, I, I found maybe a handful of flowers. I, you know, we were looking at the pink lady slipper, we were looking at the pink lady slipper, the, uh, I mean, we saw a couple of sunflowers, you know, some non-native stuff that I thought was interesting. I, I think that'll be much the same case today. We'll see some non-native stuff that is interesting, and we'll see some native stuff that is interesting. And, I mean, I, I had a few target plants in mind for today, none of which are uh, growing kind of along the parking lot here. But, I mean, what looks like, you know, probably just a side of a ditch to most people has some pretty, has some pretty nice stuff going on. And we'll start right here with... Uh, Achila millifolium, a uh, uh, species of yarrow here, not a uh, uh, member of the APACA as it uh, kind of frequently gets confused for because uh, members of the APACA have uh, umbels of flowers, uh, much in the same way that this has a fly on me, much in the same way that this has umbels of capitula, meaning that um, each of those individual uh, things appearing to be a flower is actually a cluster of multiple flowers. The individual uh, florets are uh, much smaller than they initially appear to be right there. Uh, millifolium. It's got heavily segmented foliage also like many members of the APACA do, but this is an Asteraceae. This is a member of the sunflower family. A little bit of hair on those leaves. Uh, and, you know, somewhat resembling Queen Anne's lace, of course, until you, you, you know, you really get in there and you look at the flowers. Uh, you get a mustard coming up here it is barely recognizable as a mustard it's got the uh, salix going down already gone to fruit but a couple flowers left there at the top no idea what mustard that is not really going to bother keying it out right this second we have asclepius syriaca uh, covered in bees the uh, common milkweed with its uh excuse me uh intensely interesting <laughs> flower morphology which uh if you know anything about uh milkweeds you know that they have uh, probably one of the most complex uh, flowering structures of any plant uh, in the plant kingdom they also uh, have pollinia much like orchids do of course derived from a uh, different uh, origin and i mean this thing is uh, doing exactly what it does and supplying a ton of nectar for pollinators i can smell it from here it smells quite intoxicating oh, bee just flew by me actually you can see this is a member of the APACA unfurling here, not sure which one, but uh, uh, maybe that is Queen Anne's Lace, Dacus Corota, the uh, wild carrot, but uh, too too soon to tell, and that's not really what we're here to discuss. It's kind of just an intro. You've got a uh, Cinquefoil there, member of the Rose family, and a uh, relative of the uh, really rare plant we saw up on Mount Washington uh, last time you would have, uh, in the last video. Uh, go check that out if you're watching this, and this is the first one that's probably going to be a fantastic video but uh going to go ahead and guess if this is a member of the genus potentia i'm going to double check to see if i'm wrong but uh i mean i don't really know what else that could be most likely not a ranunculus and if i get down there look at the foliage yeah it's got the uh the dentate margins on the leaves down there and the uh, divided leaves so i'm going to go with uh, definitely rose family most likely potentia looks like a syncofoil um, growing where you would expect to see one, probably one of the common species, if not an invasive species. We get some grasses, we get some clovers, some uh, clovers, of course, being infibacy. Oh, I missed this one, another another member of the uh, Asteraceae, two of them coming up here. We get a species of Erigeron. I'm not sure off the top of my head which one this is, but I bet you I could find out pretty easily uh, just by looking into it a bit. I took pictures of it already, so I can double check when I get home. You've got a uh, member of the buckwheat family there. You got a, a species of uh, what looks to be Rumex dock. Uh, not sure which species again, but uh, again, could probably pretty easily find out. Got that, uh, I think that's, I think they call that rabbit foot clover. Species of trifolium, same as uh, other species of clover. And over here, I uh, saw some a really, really, really interesting, huh? I don't think it's interesting, but there's a verbascum right there, a species of mullen. 
uh, the, the common one, Mullet, Verbascum, whatever. Uh, I know that, I just don't know the name off the top of my head. I'll put it down there below. Got that mustard again with the Sleeks. And then uh, a bunch of these coming up. These are not native. Uh, these are in the genus, Com uh, family, Comolinaceae, in the genus Comolina. I believe that this is uh, Comolina communis, the uh, Asiatic day flower. Not to be confused with uh, another member in the same family, Tritoscanthia, uh, which has three petals. This has uh, <laughs> two petals and just a really interesting flower morphology there. I'm not sure what those yellow things are. Uh, it may be uh, stigmas or styles, but uh, those are definitely the anthers right there. Actually, no, there's the... Uh, uh, maybe yeah i don't know i don't know much about the morphology of these outside of the fact that this is a comolina communis comolinaceae these are uh, not native um to the east coast of the united states unlike their uh, sister genus tratoscanthia which is not here which has three of those uh purple um petals or maybe those are bracts i uh, i gotta look a little bit deeper into this uh into this family. Um, this is my first time encountering one, and it's not native anyway, so I'm not particularly heavily invested in looking into it, but it looks pretty damn cool. You know, plenty of them coming up, up there. Um, doing well for itself, and yes, they do all have those two, uh, they do all have the two sort of Mickey Mouse ears there. You get that Origeron again, coming up right there. Uh, Parthenocystis kinkifolia, the um, Virginia Creeper doing quite well. Uh, and I think there was one other thing. Oh, you get some blackberries back there. Uh, genus on those is, uh, I'm, I always get it confused. I, I think it's a rubus is the genus for those, but I could be mistaken. Could be something else. You know, just gone to fruit right there. Not ripe. Those ones up there looking quite ripe. You've got a um, species in the family um, on a gracia here. This is a... Uh, Oh geez, I forget it. Not Circeum. Um oh, geez. Well the anyway, I, I, I knew the name of it. I, I had committed to remembering it because I was expecting to see this plant, but it's in the evening primrose family. Not related to the primrose family at all in a completely different order. It's got really odd morphology there with a with a two parted uh you know, two part flower structure there. Two two sepals. There's a guy there too. Two sepals, two petals. Uh, two stamens, and then just that single pistil there. Uh, really interesting. Common. This grows in my backyard too, which is why I was I was checking it out before. But oh, Circea, Circea um, canadensis, I believe. I know that the species epithet is canadensis because they change. There's a European species that's almost identical to this, um, and then they changed. Uh, they made this its own species when they realized they actually weren't the same species. But I digress. And then last but not least. Just a weird oxalis here with purple leaves, and I'm not sure if this is a, uh, a mutation on it or if um, this is a different uh, species of oxalis, because I know that there are some that do always have these purple leaves. I've just never seen this one, and uh, oxalis is a really, really common uh, weed, basically. You know, I mean, i got to grow it in my garden. Uh, wood sorrels, what they're commonly called, and the... Fan and the um, Actually, in their in their own whole order, it's says Oxalidaceae in the order Oxidales, which has some really weird plants in it. Actually, has a carnivorous plant in it. Um, uh, can't remember. I screwed this up last time. Just know that there's a there's a pitcher plant in this order, um, and the uh, the family for this one though is Oxidales, and the genus is Oxalis. It's a really big genus, really common, and this is one of those plants where it'll exhibit. Uh, a, a word that I can't remember that I'll put down below, but basically um, this plant is capable of folding itself up its leaves. It's getting too much sunlight so it doesn't burn out. And at night it'll uh, fold itself up and uh, kind of tuck itself into bed. Uh, quite a few species do that. Even the common weedy ones tend to do that. But uh, could this, is it Oxalis violia? Some, something? Maybe that's what this is, which would be a rare species. I mean, not rare in the grand scheme of things, but certainly more uncommon than some of the other species. But, uh, yeah, a good smattering across a couple different uh, families here. And, you know, more traditionally, this is what the oxalis looks like, which leads me to believe that maybe this is just exhibiting some sort of stress pigmentation or um, it's got a mutation. But, uh, you know, a nice smattering of... Uh, 
plants right off the bat here. I mean, we're already probably 10 or 15 minutes into this video. Yeah, 10 minutes in, and uh, we've already seen quite a few different plants and quite a few different families. But uh, it's only going to get better from here because we're going to go uh, check out that field before. I think we might run into uh, one or two different species of orchid and uh, one or two different species of um, Orobanki in the family Orobankaceae, which is a family consisting almost entirely of parasitic plants. But that's enough yammering on. We're going to go take a walk through the woods. Oh, hey, check it out. It's Sassafras albidium, a member of the ECA. Same family as that uh, Lindera benzoan, which I guess grows out here too. Oh, this plant smells so good. I didn't mean to. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. It's like a scratch and sniff, you know? I didn't actually mean to do that. I was just trying to hold the leaf, but I I was, uh, yeah, whatever. He'll be fine. But uh, yeah, this plant smells really good. If you, give that, if you give that foliage a light rub, a light rub, and you take a whiff, oh, it smells great. Okay, speaking of orchids, we actually got one here, but not not no longer in flower. Done for the season. Leathery leaves left behind. This was a Cypripedium McCall, which would have been going off back in May. In fact, we saw it going off here. There was the, uh, it's the bract left over from the inflorescence. And uh, yeah, Cypripedium McCall, all done for the year. Okay, so this guy's just starting to emerge for the season. I was gonna do a whole video on this plant. Uh, at some other point, this is a real interesting one. So this is a achlorophilus, meaning it produces no chlorophyll mycoheterotroph, which means that it's parasitizing fungus in the blueberry family, Ericaceae. And this is uh, Monotropa uniflora, just emerging from its uh, from its leafy, leafy base for the season. Oh, white flowers. Get in there. There's the uh, weird looking uh, stigma there. Uh, Yes, microheterotroph. So this plant produces no chlorophyll. It does not photosynthesize. It parasitizes fungus that associate with the plants surrounding it. There's in a little patch there. And I guess, I guess I'll, this is another one that really uh, is a pet peeve of mine because if you're going to find an achlorophilus uh, microheterotroph, this is probably going to be it, assuming you're on the east coast of the United States. I mean, this plant grows throughout the U.S., throughout uh, in a lot of spots in Canada, has a population in Mexico, I guess it has scattered populations in Asia. It's a really widespread plant, and I mean, in my opinion, a fairly common plant too, but uh, people lose their minds when they find out about this plant. And it's Okay, I gotta bite my tongue here, um, because I've since learned a little bit more about the distribution of this plant. Um, specifically that well, it's locally abundant in New England, or at least in some areas of New England. Um, this plant is extremely rare. Uh, there's a good reason why people were losing their minds and I was posting this so often. That's because if you're from the Midwest or you're from down south or you're from out west, this plant is probably pretty darn rare, cryptic, and hard to find. Um, we're going to see in a jump cut in a little bit, I examine a closely related plant, or I guess somewhat closely related plant to this. Um, might share a subfamily, uh, might not. The, the jury's kind of out on that one, but that's besides the point right now. Uh, and you'll actually see the same plant at a different location, which is essentially on the side of a parking lot um, outside the office building I work at. So it's not really hard to come across this plant where I'm at. Uh, your mileage may vary. I guess this plant is subject to a lot of poaching because people think you can make a magic potion out of it. Um, I, I've actually since gotten into online arguments with people about harvesting this plant. Uh, don't take it for granted. I don't anymore. And it's a really cool plant. And if you are fortunate enough to live in New England where it is apparently locally abundant or you happen to be in an area where you've just happened to come across it, just don't disturb the plant. These are, you know, depend on a very specialized, they have a very specialized ecology and um, they don't need to be harvested. They don't need to be disturbed. Uh, and I apologize for taking the plant for granted. It's just a cool little niche thing that uh, we're fortunate enough to have an abundance of in my area. So anyway, back to the video. It's not even that unusual. You have the entire subfamily Monotropoidae that produces uh, Achlorophilus, um, Achlorophilus parasitic plants like this. Monotropoidae, of course, being a subfamily of the uh, blueberry family Ericaceae. 
um, which has an intense mycorrhizal association, much like orchids do. Uh, and then eventually you had a whole uh, subfamily that is a monophyletic group all branching off from a single ancestor, figured out how to turn that mycorrhizal association one-sided and essentially parasitize off of them while doing no work of its own. It basically just comes out the flower. And again, th this thing, no chlorophyll whatsoever. Uh, the Orobancaceae plants, the family uh, Orobancaceae, um, has a lot of parasitic members too uh, that are uh, what you would call hemiparasitic, which they do photosynthesize, but they also parasitize. Of course, some of them are achlorophilous, but many of them are uh, hemiparasitic, meaning that they can you know, produce their own sugars through photosynthesis, um, but they also steal a little bit from the plants around them. And I mean, we're not going to get into it right now because on the odd chance I don't come across one, and I hope I do come across one, just know that that's parasitizing another plant directly. This is parasitizing a fungus. This is a mycoheterotroph. That's a, uh, and then uh, oral bancasia has a lot of uh, hollow parasites. You know, they're coming up right along the... Uh, right amongst the rocks here. These ones look kind of weird compared to how I usually see them. Normally you see them kind of nodding over, but I think these ones are just emerging. It's very early in the season for them. And uh, you'll see these uh, going off until August. But uh, Monotropa uniflora, common name for this guy's ghost pipe. And if you've got oak trees, pine trees, beech trees uh, in your backyard or in the woods behind your house, and you've never seen anything like this, uh, you know, go take a look. You know in a really shady spot you know under a fern like this one is because these things will come up basically in complete darkness again they, they need no light to survive just that uh fungal um just that fungal host for them to latch on to oh some, something's over there but uh, we're going to keep moving on fantastic plant i was planning to do a video about this one and about uh, one of its close relatives chemophila maculata um, which both grow in close proximity behind my workplace, but uh, you know, why not? It's here. We'll talk about it now. I think there's another species of Chemophila that grows in these woods, Chemophila umbellata, Chemophila umbellata, which would be cool to look at too. Uh, same subfamily, different tribe. Those are in the Pyroliae tribe. These are in the Monotropoidea, Monotropoidae, however you say it. I suck with the pronunciations of subfamilies and tribes, but you get the idea. Um, uh, although I guess there is evidence to, yeah, I'm getting way ahead of myself. Just know that this plant is something you can find growing in a lot of places up here in New England and on the East Coast and in other places in the United States. It, it despite its weird appearance, is not rare and it has a fascinating ecology. Yeah, look, see, see how it does that? Just a white ghost plant coming up uh, under under a blueberry coming up under one of its relatives, uh, Vaccinium corymbosum up here with uh, just a handful of blueberries left on it. But uh, yeah, it makes me wonder and it would it would make sense. And I'm purely hypothesizing here that that uh, monotropa right there is parasitizing the fungus that is uh, associating with the root tissue of this uh, blueberry, this Vaccinium here. And uh, why that makes sense is because they're they're both in the same plant family, even though that's a creepy looking. Well, I shouldn't say creepy. I think it's I think it's a beautiful plant. Uh, you know, white parasite. Here's another one here. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, both they're both equipped to associate with the same fungus, per perhaps uh, in a different way. And I mean, as you can see, they are loving. They are loving it here. I don't know why these look so weird. I, I think they might just look like this when they first emerge. And then they might, uh, you know, because they're quite beautiful when you see them later on in the summer. And the flowers do last for a while. They get quite woody and they persist through the winter. I think I've shown that in another video. But uh, they could also be associating with the pine trees here. I mean, I've seen plenty of them. They're just really aggressively growing in this patch under this uh, Vaccinium corymbosum, which got me uh, a little bit suspicious. But uh, yeah, we're going to keep moving on. We're going to uh, maybe learn a thing or two about parasitism today and micro mycorrhizal associations, if we can see some orchids. But uh, the Orobancaceae, like I already said, are mostly parasitizing the roots of other plants, not uh, not doing anything funky with the uh, fungus. I mean, I'm sure there's something going on with the fungus, but I, I, I just really want to see one. Okay, cut me some slack. Okay, his flowers aren't open yet, but here's a, uh, you know, those flowers aren't ready to go yet. 
Here's a plant in the same uh, subfamily as that monotropa, monotropoidea subfamily. This is a Chemophila maculata, a plant we've seen before. Uh, striped wintergreen, spotted wintergreen, whatever you want to call it. Family's Ericaceae, got those evergreen, uh, quite quite waxy um, and plasticky leaves. Uh, you know, just uh, not quite not quite ready to uh, not quite ready to wake up for the season. But that's okay. Uh, I've been, I, I know a couple populations of this plant, which is quite rare in some states. Um, not too uncommon here in Massachusetts. But uh, I keep an eye on this guy. He grows behind my office too. And when it opens up, it's got weird, weird flowers, man. Uh, we'll take a look at those uh, when they open up. But apparently there's another family, another uh, plant in the same genus here. Um, Chemophila. Yeah, see, it's in, a, in the same family as the ghost pipes there. Monotropody gets some great plants, man. But Achimophila umbellata is the other one that apparently grows here. So we'll keep an eye out for that one too. Okay, so we've got a uh, oral bancasia here. This is Melampyrum linear. All right. So oral bancasia is a family of almost entirely parasitic plants. Many of them... Uh, excuse me. I'm just going to zoom in here for you. Many of them... Uh, hollow parasites meaning that they're partially parasitic as you can see this guy's still got uh, plenty of um plenty of chlorophyll in there in the order of mints as evidenced by the uh, opposite leaves in the uh bilabiate bilaterally symmetrical flower there um in its own family look at the weird spurs on the on the on the uh, base of those leaves so that's kind of that's kind of cool but uh i don't know what this guy's parasitizing could be anything um again Completely capable of photosynthesizing on its own coming up kind of in mass here on the edge of the woodland Here's the field behind us, which we started in last time. I shot the video opted not to this time and yeah uh, My first encounter with this plant uh, Grows mostly most of its range. I guess is in Canada. However, it does come down uh, into Appalachia um, In the southeastern extent of its range is basically uh, you know down there in the Carolinas at uh, you know likes the uh grassy areas likes kind of dry sites apparently but uh yeah give you one last close-up of the uh flowers there oh there's an ant hello and uh we'll keep moving on okay look it's a species of uh hypericum saint john's wort uh this might be the uh one from europe i i forget i didn't write down uh, the species this is my first time really coming in into contact with this, but that's uh, unmistakably Hypericum, St. John's wort, uh, Hypericaceae, I believe is how that's uh, pronounced. Let's flip this guy over. What's he got going on underneath? Oh, that's kind of nice. All those uh, stamens poking out there, five petals. Uh, some of these, I guess, grow into trees down on the Ego Salta here. Quite a few species in the uh, family. And in the genus, um, yeah, I just I'm not sure what species this is. Definitely St. John's wort, though. Uh, people take this as a uh, tincture for uh, depression, and I guess there's actually uh, some good research into that coming up with the uh, Fabaceous clovers and the vetch, Fabaceae pea family, none of which I believe is native. Uh, certainly not the clovers, and I remember this guy from last time, an invasive. Uh, Karyophyllaceous plant. I think it's Stellaris is the genus on that one. But uh, yeah, oh, plenty of that. Plenty of that vetch. And then, oh, you got that syncofoil too coming up back there. But uh, we're getting close to where allegedly, oh, there's another, there's another St. John's wort. And a, and a, uh, and a fox grape too. Family's uh, Vitaceae on that. Plenty of, plenty of good common plants. You get this nasty looking customer here. All spiky. Maybe a type of thistle or a type of a sow thistle. But uh, I, I, I digress. We're gonna go look for we're gonna go look for uh, that that uh, Platanthera orchid. But uh, yeah, Hypericum. Nice to see. Nice to see. Okay, we're gonna try this again. Yesterday I was out here. It was raining. I got confused. I got long-winded, and I was not being clear in what I wanted to say. So as a uh, amendment to the video, I was shooting in Towel Land. Uh, which is just a towel land, it's such a funny name. The conservation lands, you know, over there in Carlisle. Um, I came across a plant which I've talked about numerous times uh, so far, which is Chemophila maculata, striped wintergreen, spotted wintergreen, whatever you want to call it, which as you can see is in flower right in front of me. Family's Ericaceae, um, subfamily is treated as either Monotropoideae or um, Pyroloideae. 
uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. And uh, let's just look at those flowers for a minute here. What is going on? Get the five petals, 10 stamens, although it looks like about 20, because those anthers there are quite weird. And let's talk for a second about what's going on with these anthers. These are what you uh, would refer to as porocytal anthers, right? So instead of opening up like a hot dog bun and dumping out the pollen, the theca on these form uh, tubes. So an anther has two theca. Uh, not always. There are some exceptions to that. Um, but on most, uh, most um, flower-bearing plants, the anthers will have two theca. And inside of those two theca are two sporangium uh, producing the pollen. And uh, some plants that do this, this uh, porocytal dehiscence, as it's referred to, are what is called buzz pollinated, meaning that a bumblebee or an insect has to get in there and vibrate at a specific frequency to get the pollen to uh, dump out of there, thus preventing uh, unnecessary pollen loss and wasting more energy. However, I just read a paper, and I'll put the name of which down below, which is a bit dated, but uh, basically determined that uh, that was likely not the case. While these are utilizing porosetal dehiscence, they're not buzz pollinated. There's no specific frequency at which uh, this needs to a bug needs to vibrate to uh, get the pollen to come out. Rather, it's just knocking against those and getting the pollen on it on accident as it goes for the nectar. And as you can see, this thing's producing quite a bit of nectar. That green button right there is the uh, pistil. Specifically, that sticky part is the uh, stigma. Whoa. Which looks a little bit uh, a little bit crass to me, but uh, you'll note that other plants that are similarly related to this, uh, and I guess we'll get into the second part here, which is uh, monotropoidae or pyroloidae, as it's now uh, sometimes treated, have that uh, big buttony uh, stigma as well. Uh, plant is um, doing quite well here. I guess it tends to form uh, clonal little communities. Uh, no evidence to support whether this is a clonal community, but there are individuals in smaller patches scattered around. That's a but oh, it's, oh, he's got something there. Oh, he took an inchworm. Oh, no. Uh, Forget ants, man. Uh, it smells quite good. It smells like soap. And I'm going to show you. We'll come back. These are the seed pods, which I've shown you before. This is one from last year that apparently isn't going to flower this year. Uh, it smells quite good. And it was historically treated as being related to, yeah, here's a real good patch here, a plant we did see earlier in the video, that uh, Monotropa uniflora coming up en masse here. has also got that really sticky, um, bizarre-looking uh, stigma. And in addition, it's dealing with those. Let's peel this back a little bit. These aren't fully mature yet. Come on, don't focus on my thumb, focus on those anthers. Yeah, you can see the similarities in the anther structure there. Ten of them, ten stamens, 20 uh, little uh, twenty little theca in there, two per, two per stamen, two per anther, I should say. And uh, this is, of course, a root parasite, as I went on at length about before. But uh, we have another member, <clears throat> excuse me, of this um, just general clade of plants right here. Not coming up yet, but this was actually in the same genus as that Monotropa uniflora. This was previously treated as Monotropa hippopides and is now uh, recognized in its own genus, Hippopity monotropa. I might have gotten that mixed up. It might be uh, Monotropa hippopity and now Hippopides monotropa, but either way, I'll put the correct thing. And just look at the similarity between the seed pods on this and then the seed pods on Chemophila maculata and tell me that even if they're not in the same subfamily, there's certainly something going on there with similar relationships. And of course, this is not just Chemophila maculata. If it was, you'd have that basal rosette of lovely evergreen variegated leaves, which we do not have. So it's just in this one little spot, an interesting cross section of a we of a I think weird. Where'd he go? Oh, I just lost him. Uh, anyway, of a weird areas of a weird branch of the family Ericaceae. These are all related to blueberries, um, and just one of my favorite subfamilies. All heavily, heavily associating 
with the um, fungus in the soil here. Hippopodes and Monotropa over there, obviously um, parasitizing the fungus and Chemophila maculata, which uh, again smells fantastic. There's another individual over here. Of course, uh, merely being Michael Reisel with the fungus that is working in association with it, uh, similar to a number of the other plants you see growing here, these oaks, these pines, um, etc. So I just meant to make this as an addendum to uh, the video I started working on over the weekend just because I couldn't find, I really wanted to find this plant flower, this uh, Chemophila, and we had um, been able to see the monotropa. Yeah, you can see no leaves, no basil rosette. Again, this plant produces no chlorophyll. It just pops right out of the soil. Uh, I just wanted to show you these plants in uh, growing in a close uh, proximity to one another. And uh, hopefully I can come back in a couple weeks and we can see the uh, Hippopodes monotropa going off too. Uh, in the paper I read, it said that a lot of plants that associate with this clade um, flower at different times, though they grow sympatric with close relatives, so Chemophila maculata grows sympatrically with Chemophila umbellata, which flowers a little bit earlier than it, and I suspect, with no basis for speculation, that uh, this monotropa, which blooms, a summer bloomer, blooms into August, might be uh, blooming a bit ahead of um, its relative, who's out of frame, because I'm stupid and I can't, it just blends in really well the Hippopodes monotropa. So maybe we'll come back after the Chima, uh, after, uh, sorry, monotropa has kind of a withered away for the season. In any case, this is just an addendum to the video already in progress. I'm gonna go back to those lands, um, maybe in a week or two, try and find that orchid. And if I can get that orchid on film um, and then just put this video out. So until then, uh, I guess, you know, hopefully the next scene you see is me finding that Platanthor orchid. But uh, just one last thought to leave you on. I misspoke. I called this plant common as hell, the uh, Monotropa uniflora. And as you can see, it does just fine here. Comes up in plenty of different spots. But um, it's not, uh... oh, what's this? What the heck is that? I think that that was a <laughs> that was Chima that was Chima fine not Umbalada that was a Pyrola I think I missed this guy oh no I completely missed him I don't even know what it was I'll have to take a picture of this and try and figure it out probably <laughs> probably another relative of all these other uh, monotrope monotro yeah monotropoidea pyroloidea whatever you want to call it probably yet another relative of them I'm not sure which one this one is maybe Pyrola. Americana, I can't tell, but uh, Jesus, definitely another one of these ericaceous plants from that clade. I'm losing my mind, but yeah, that's a nice batch of them right there. Uh, not rare here, but I guess the population of this ends up being highly disjunct, meaning you get a lot of gaps between where it does um, tend to grow. Man, I feel stupid that I missed that. That was probably cool looking, but uh, I digress. We're gonna we're gonna move on from this, and we're going to um, we're gonna look at some other. So we're gonna cut this video up, edit it together, and it'll hopefully run more seamlessly than it seems to me in this moment right now. But anyway, have a good one. Well, I had come back out here uh, looking for that orchid. This is now the third time filming for one video, which I I kind of don't like doing. I'd much rather split a single day up into multiple videos because I'm lazy. But, uh, yeah, why not? Three days in one video. So I'm out here looking for this goddamn orchid. And I still haven't seen it. And I've seen some cool stuff going off, including uh, this plant that I finally... I've been here for a minute. I finally just stopped because this caught my eye. Superficially, this kind of looked like the Platanthera that I'm looking for, but it's not. This is actually a Lobelia. Get up in there so you can see those... Uh, Pretty, uh, pretty, um, distinct lobili flowers there. There's the anther column there in the middle. So you get the three, three pointed down, two pointing up. Bilateral flowers grown on a spike. And this is lobelia spicata in the uh, family Campanulaceae. 
Same family as bluebells and uh, same order as uh, sunflowers, actually. But uh, not what we're here for. This is a pleasant surprise. And I'll, uh, you know, zoom back out for you there. You know, lobelias are great. You know, you get them all sorts of, uh, all sorts of places. You get some really nice ones even here, too. This one's, um, you know, not terribly showy, but this one's really tolerant of the dry conditions. And, uh, yeah, just a nice lobelia. This is the first spot I saw it. There's one laying down here. Yeah, lobelia is a good one to know. I guess uh, not much diversity. I mean, there's a few species in, in the in the genus here in the Northeast, but I guess as you go through the Midwest, you presumably get quite a few more of them. We're gonna take a look at a member of the carrot family in a minute. I'm just I'm making one last pass for this orchid, uh, and this was the only thing that really made me uh you know stop for a moment because I'm like, God damn, is that a lobelia? And uh, yeah, these are videos are running together kind of weird because I was here, then I was. Uh, Oh God, where was I? Oh no, I've been here three times. Jeez, I'm losing my mind. I was here looking for the orchid. We saw Chimophila maculata, not in bloom. Then I took it behind work where we looked at it. We saw Pyrola americana. And now we're looking at a lobelia. So this is going to be a mishmash. But it's a, it's a cross section of a couple different areas at the same time of the year. I think it's been about 10 days since I first came to look for this orchid. But I digress. We're gonna take one last pass around. I got a couple plants that I can show you, and then I'll probably cut it off because I don't want to get cut out, cut out here in the dark. Lobelia spicata, everyone. Kind of a weird one here. I forget the scientific name, but this is a mayapple. Just a single erect peltate leaf coming up out of the ground. Flowers would dangle down under beneath, but uh, these are well past flowering or they're on their way out. Forget the, I even forget the family on this one. I guess these are actually technically more um, more so from the Mid-Atlantic than they are from the Northeast. They've been introduced up here, but they might be native to like Connecticut. I don't know much about this plant. I'll have to put the scientific name and the family down there. It's coming up with Simplocarpus fluididus and some ferns. And as you can see, the vernal pool is drying out for the year. So uh, most of these... Uh, uh, you know, more damp loving plants are on their way out for the season. But we're gonna continue along here because I gotta I gotta get out of the woods pretty soon. It's getting dark. Still no still no orchid. Still no signs of it. I don't know man. Maybe it's just uh maybe it's too dry this year. Last year was certainly a lot wetter out through this part of the year. But uh whatever. Get a little ways to walk before we can uh, say for sure. So I'm here walking along the frog bog and these little squeakers are just going off as I walk, just sounding off as I uh, <laughs> get get too close. It's kind of cute. I mean, it was like a cacophony walking down here, but they know I'm here, so they quieted down. Like little squeaky toys. Oh god, the black flies are really bad flying into my eyes. I'm not getting bit, but I'm getting bugs in my eyes. Ah, oh, there goes another one. All right, we're gonna wrap it up right here with this one. A plant, uh, you know, if you spend any time hanging out around uh, plant identification, I don't know. I'm, I'm talking about Reddit right now. I swear I hear like somebody standing right behind me, but that's clearly not the case. This is a uh, Dacus Corota. AKA Queen Anne's Lace, AKA Wild Carrot. Oh, it's a big bee. I just, I just uh, knocked them off a bit. And uh, in the same, in the carrot family, obviously, APACA. And uh, you will be able to differentiate this from the remarkably toxic uh, poison hemlock by the fact that there's that little yellow center flower there. This is an umble, just a cluster of flowers with some guys hanging out in there. Hi, guys. Hairy stem, and uh, yeah, that's what that foliage looks like. That a uh, carrot or a uh, kind of parsley looking foliage. So, yeah, this is Dacus corota, this is a wild carrot, Queen Anne's lace, not poison hemlock. Poison hemlock has no hairs, it grows much larger. It's got little purple splotches on there, and no, uh, never has that uh, little central flower there. Is it titmouse up there? It's a funny name for a bird, huh? Maybe that's making all the noise, but I figured he'd wrap it up with this guy. 
just because I'm tired of uh, seeing people ask me, hey, how do you tell the difference between Queen Anne's lace and poison hemlock, even though there's about a thousand uh, species in this family of plants that all have that same lacy foliage, tall upright stature, and uh, white umbrella flowers. You get uh, some like a uh, zizia, I think that's what it is, zizia, have yellow flowers too, golden alexander. But um, yeah, some of them are edible, some of them are deadly poisonous. Why don't you uh, do the smart thing and uh, keep them all out of your mouth? Uh, yeah, seems like a no-brainer to me. But uh, pardon my somewhat salty mood. My uh, ankle is bleeding, and I did not find uh, the orchid I was hoping to see on my third round here. But that's, that's just life. And uh, yeah, plenty more time to botanize this summer. <laughs> It is a pretty flower. Not native, but pretty. They kind of stink. All right. We'll, uh, we'll cut it off there before I get overly negative. And uh, certainly plenty of other beautiful things to look at today. All these are all solid doggo. Goldenrod's getting ready to go off. So in about maybe three or four weeks, this entire uh, field will just be lit up. Beautiful yellow.